following. Uh, but I got hanging on some thoughts in chapter 3, verses 8 through 11, and I want to go back and pick up on a couple of points, the last two that we looked at last Sunday. And so we're still focusing on the issue of knowing Christ in a transforming way. But there are some amazing truths that Paul lays out in this letter, and we can't cultivate and develop everything, but I'm going to attempt to go back and pick up some thoughts, if you will, from earlier chapters and coming into this one, because he is dealing with the issue of our identity in Christ, verse 9 in chapter 3, that I may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law. And what's amazing about this letter is that as he defines us in Christ, he defines us in a way that has vast implications as he begins this letter in Philippians 1.1. He says that we are saints in Christ. And it's amazing because he begins by talking about the fact that he and Timothy are slaves, but we are saints. And he is developing this thought of this union that we have with Christ, that the regenerated soul is brought into this vital union with Christ. And it isn't something that is momentary, it's something that is ongoing in our life, that this is a living relationship, and there's many things that come as a result of this, but the reality of it is, is that this is a mystery to us. And it isn't just because I, I say so because I have trouble understanding it, maybe you don't, but it's what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 32, he says, this mystery is great, and I've heard some refer to this as regards to marriage, but that's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about Christ and his relationship to the church and the intimacy of that relationship and the union that exists. He helps us to understand that the knowledge of this union is inaccessible to humans except through this special revelation from God. In Colossians chapter 1, he says this, he says, It is the mystery which has been hidden from past ages and generations, but has now been manifested to His saints, to whom God will to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery. Now notice, this is what the mystery is among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's the mystery that He indwells each one of us. That there is this vital connection of our soul that the moment we were regenerated with Jesus Christ and His life is in us. That we possess the resurrected life and it flows through us because Christ dwells in us and the bond of that dwelling is the presence of His Spirit in each one of us. This is amazing, is it not? And these thoughts, he just flows back and forth as he goes through this letter, as he touches on all of these things. But this relationship is transforming to us. It's to shape our person, our, our, our passions, our perspective on things, even the things that we pursue. All of these things Paul deals with in chapter 3 of Philippians. He helps us to see some amazing things about this union with Christ. First, it is, it is judicial in nature. In other words, in Him we are accounted as being righteous. And this is what he addresses in chapter 3, verse 9. Our union with Christ is sanctifying. In chapter 1, verse 1, he refers to us as being saints in Christ. We have been set apart in Christ Jesus. There is this objective status that we have that Christ's merits are imputed to each one of us. This is why we can stand before God. And on the final day, we will stand uncondemned before God because of the imputed work of Christ into our life but it comes with an ethical condition. It calls from us a holiness, a life of purity, a life of sacredness. Our union with Christ is a spiritual one in nature. Christ dwells in us by His Spirit, and His Spirit is the bond of this union. Our union with Christ is a vital one. He's going to deal with this in chapter 4, verse 13, where he says that I can do all things, not through Him, but in Him who strengthens me. In other words, His life actually flows through us. It's ever-present in us. And it gives us the strength that we need to deal with the things in life. Paul says, I can do all things in Him who strengthens me. This isn't just an ordinary relationship. It's not like any other relationship that we have in this life. 
We've been saved to know Christ, Paul helps us to understand in chapter 3. Not merely to know facts about Him, we're not playing Bible trivia, but it is to have this communion with Him, a vital living union with Christ, that we become conformed to Him and His image. That we become like Him. And how far does this image bearing go and this desire to be like Him? Verses 10 and 11. That I may know Him and the power of His resurrection. And notice, and the fellowship of His sufferings being conformed to His death. How many of us have this aspiration in our lives? I want to suffer the sufferings of Christ. I want to be conformed to His death that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Do you get up in the morning? Is this your goal for the day? <laughs> See, it changes everything for us. So Paul's going to reflect on his mistakes, but now he takes us to the marvelous encounter that he had with Christ and this knowing of Christ as a transforming impact upon our life. He began in verses 7 and 8 that knowing Christ transforms one's values and priorities. And these next two points are where I want to focus this morning. Verses 8 and 9 and 10 and 11. And 10 and 11 are going to prepare us for verses 12 and following. But I want to talk a little bit this morning about the righteousness. This is an important truth. Paul helps us to see from verses 8 and 9 that knowing Christ is a source of righteousness transforms us to live a life of faith. Keep trusting in Him. Just keep trusting in Him. It's a lifelong process for us. And he begins in chapter 3, verse 8, and he talks about this knowledge of Christ. And this term for knowledge, and we need to understand this, he's speaking of an intimate communion with Christ, and we see this in the reference that he makes of Christ, that he is his Lord, my Lord. This is direct, this is personal. There is this intimate relationship and devotion that he has to him. He began this letter with referring to the fact that he is a bond slave of the Lord Jesus Christ because he purchased him, so now he belongs to him, and now he serves him, and he desires to fulfill his will and everything that he does in his life. And he is going to call us to understand the Lordship of Jesus Christ and to live in light of that. First, he begins in chapter 3, verse 1, that we are to rejoice in the Lord. But this is a thought that's going to run all the way into chapter 4 and then over and over he's going to talk about being in the Lord, in the Lord, in the Lord, in the Lord. It's understanding that he is the sovereign one. Now what's interesting is that Paul is bringing an Old Testament concept into the New Testament, applying it to Christ. In the Old Testament, the issue was knowing God in an intimate, personal way. This is what the Hebrew word yada means. It's used in reference to Adam knowing Eve. There is an intimacy there. There is a uniqueness there. In other words, I remind you that in the Old Testament, the word religion is never used. Why? Because it's always about a relationship. And this is the thought that Paul brings over here into Ephesians or into Philippians chapter 3 as he talks about a relationship to Christ. It isn't merely a theoretical knowing. It isn't merely just having facts of, but it is walking in an intimate communion with Him. And the Lord Himself gives this beautiful explanation through the prophet Jeremiah when he says this, the Lord says, Let not a wise man boast of his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast of his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts boast of this, that he understands and knows me. That I am the Lord who exercises loving kindness, justice, and righteousness on the earth. For I delight in these things, declares the Lord. This is the thing to boast in. There are many things that we applaud in life, but this, this is the one. This is the one. Not merely that we know Him, but we understand Him, and we know that He works out of who He is, His very nature, His loving kindness, His justice, and righteousness. That these are His attributes manifested in the things that He does. When we know Him, we understand these things. And then when we look at the things that happen in our life, we understand who He is as He works. This word gnosis is an experiential knowledge then. It's not merely just a passing acquaintance. 
Some here may know some facts about Christ, but not, may not know Christ. Maybe they have entered into that relationship with Christ through faith. But Paul isn't talking about something superficial here. This gnosis is not simply an intellectual head knowledge of Christ. It refers to an intimate personal knowledge of Him. This isn't merely just a past experience that happens at our conversion. This is something that is to be ongoing, that is to be increasing. Are we growing in this relationship with Christ? In other words, are we coming before the Word of God and spending time there trying to seek and understand who Christ is? That we might comprehend Him in a greater way. That our life might be conformed to His. You know, we had that saying some time back, you know, what would Jesus do? And I, I sort of cringed at that a little bit because there's some issues that could come as a result of that. One is subjectivity, right? What would Jesus do? So when you're in a situation and you ask yourself that question, there is a tendency at times to be subjective and sort of to, to think upon yourself as, as somehow you can answer that in and of yourself. Well, I think this is what Jesus would do, not necessarily working based on truth from the Word of God. However, if we ask that question and we go to the Scriptures and we look at His character and who He is and the things that He does, and that is what shapes how we respond to situations, that's a radically different thing. But do we do that in our life? Am I living a Christ-like life? When I'm at work and the things that I do, am I, am I asking myself this question? Am I being Christ-like in the things that I'm doing here? Do people see that I have this living relationship with Him? Or is it merely just something that, that I throw on a cloak that I put on for this day out of the week or that day out of the week and the rest of the week not so much? Paul understands that regeneration, we receive Christ, we receive knowledge of Christ, but this is just the beginning of the discovery. There's more to know of him. I remember a brother was sharing with me one time, and, and he had been saved as he shared his testimony with me when he was a kid. Went to church his whole life. And then came this revealing statement from him, just blew my mind. When I asked him what he was studying in scriptures, where was he spending his quiet time with the Lord, and what were some of the things that he was learning, and he says, you know, I've never sat down and read the Bible on my own ever. How do you do that? How do you do that and then walk through life thinking that you're living a Christ-like life or that you know Christ at all, really, and that you are behaving in a way that you, He would want you to do? How do you know that you're fulfilling His will if you're not in His Word and seeing and understanding who He is, seeing and savoring Him? Blew my mind. So I just took some time and exhorted him from the Word of God, his need to be in the Word of God. See, our conversion was just the beginning. At age seven, my eyes were open to some amazing truths, but that was just the start. There's so much more to know. And Paul's going to further develop this knowledge that he's going to talk about in verse 10 and 11. But Spurgeon writes this, he says, Spiritual knowledge of Christ will be a personal knowledge. It can't, I cannot know Jesus through another person's acquaintance with Him. In other words, just because I'm raised in a Christian home doesn't mean that I know Jesus Christ. This was a great revelation for me in my own relationship with him that this is my faith. It isn't just merely the faith of my mother and father, but this is my God. This is my Savior. This is my Lord. And this is my relationship with him. Sometimes we try to live our faith vicariously through other people. I had a friend who used to do this all the time. The Lord would bring people into his life and then he would, he would have a barbecue and invite them over and then he would say, all right, Steve, introduce me to this individual and say, okay, now unleash yourself on them. You lead them to Christ. You, you disciple them. And I said, no, the Lord brought them into your life. This is for you to do. 
Spurgeon says, no, I must know him myself and I must know him on my own account. It will be an intelligent knowledge in this that it, and that I must know him not as the visionary dreams of him, but as the word reveals him. Haven't you ever had a conversation with someone when they talk about Jesus Christ and you're just sitting there thinking to yourself, that's not the Jesus I know. I must know his natures, I must know him as divine and as human, and I must know his offices, his attributes, his works, his shame and his glory. All of this is covered in chapter 2 of Philippians. It will be an affectionate knowledge of him indeed if I know him at all. I must love him. Our knowledge of him will be a satisfying knowledge and at the same time it will be an exciting knowledge because the more I know, the more I shall want to know. In other words, the higher I climb, the loftier will the summits be, and they will invite my eager footsteps to travel on. In the light of such expansive knowledge, it's interesting how Paul refers to him simply not as Christ, nor even Christ Jesus, but as Christ Jesus, my Lord. And I just challenge you, read through Philippians and see how many times he uses that full designation of Jesus Christ as Lord. Because the reality is for Paul that he really knows Christ Jesus as his Lord, the surpassing qualities of Christ and his salvation make anything of his own insignificant and empty. This leads us to the righteousness of Christ, verse 9. And I begin with this thought from Spurgeon. He says, what a precious place to be found in, in him, trusting in him, hidden away in him, a member of his body, as it were, losing myself in him. I know that theologically that's not possible. We still retain our personality, and there is a distinctness. Yet I understand his sentiment here, because this is what we desire, to be conformed to him, to be everything like him, to think like him, to have emotions like him. When Paul writes to the church of Philippi, and he refers to the fact that he loves them and cares for them, he does so according to the affections of Christ Jesus not only that, but he dwells on the fruit of righteousness that is to come from Jesus Christ, that our lives would be filled with this. You see, that somehow that we would know him so well that he takes over in a sense, right? So often I say this to myself and in my prayer, I desire to be lost in him. Because when I'm lost in him, then I'm truly found. Paul says, in the end of this, I want to be found in him, verse 9. He's going to reflect on his union with Christ. This is what this phrase is, in him. I would render this oftentimes in the sphere of Christ, but in union with him is, is capturing the idea and the thought of the doctrine that lays behind all of these statements that he makes. And it isn't as though Paul isn't already in Christ. As a Christian, he is in Christ even in this life. We all are. He makes such statements as having put on Christ or that he is hidden in Christ. And he understands that these are the expressions of his faith and his relationship with Christ. That is here, that is now. But what he is doing here in verse 9 is he's looking to the future. In other words, this is an eschatological statement. This is an error subjunctive. He is looking forward to the future. He is looking forward to the day of Christ. He knows that he is going to stand before him and have to give an account. As we all will. So a dear friend of mine says, we're all going to have an exit interview, brothers and sisters. And Paul is looking forward to this. And this is the standing that he wants to have. In other words, Paul wants to be found undeniably that he had been in vital spiritual union with Christ. That he walked in the reality of this. Or as Barnes well puts it, he says, When the investigations of the great day should take place in regard to the ground of salvation, it might be found that he was united to the Redeemer and depended solely on his merits for salvation. Because it's only then that we can stand before the scrutiny of God. It's not in our righteousness, it's in the righteousness of Christ. And the statements that he makes in verse 9, I bring you back to this thought. It's all seen in the structure for us as he lays this out because this is the word order of the original as the Spirit leads Paul to write. But he says, not having my own, and it is 
paralleled by upon faith. But notice, this is a contrast here. It's an emphatic contrast that he's making. We'll see that in the heart of this. But just understand, it's not something of my own, but it's upon faith. So what does that say about the faith then? See what I'm saying? This is huge. You go back to chapter 1. That grace gift that God has given us. That grace gift, verse 29, is not only to believe in Him, but also to suffer for His sake. The grace gift is twofold. The faith and the suffering, both are grace gifts from God. That's what it says. Amazing thing about that statement in chapter 1, it isn't just merely talking about a point in time at our conversion, but it is present tense. That faith that is ongoing in our life is a grace gift from God. That faith, right, that carries us through the sufferings that we go through. There is a righteousness that is out of the law, and then there is a righteousness that is out of God. And that, that is the contrast that Paul lays out here. There are two different types. But the one that he is talking about is that which is through faith in Christ. Emphatic contrast, and the verb having here, carries for both thoughts. Not having this kind of righteousness, but having this kind of righteousness, the out-of-God righteousness. So what exactly is righteousness? It's an important concept in Paul's writings. The book of Romans, a vast majority of the book of Romans is all about righteousness. Well, what is this? As he touches on it here in chapter 3, it refers to an uprightness specifically with regard to one's status before God. This is our standing before God, that we are declared righteous before Him. Isn't it amazing? There are believers that are walking around not even cognizant of the things that have happened to them in Christ. So much of our struggles is the fact that we don't know our identity in Him. We don't know the things that God has accomplished and achieved in our life, in and through Jesus Christ, and by the presence of His Spirit. And we struggle so often in life not realizing the things that lie within. And so Paul wants us to understand these things, that this is your status before God. And an individual must attain a righteousness in the sight of God in order to avoid facing his wrath. And that is really what the issue of righteousness is addressing. Now this is important, okay? This is important. Turn with me in your Bibles to Romans chapter 1. Paul talks about in chapter 1, and most of you probably know this by heart, so if you don't want to turn there. But in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, he talks about the fact that, this, that the gospel is the power of God into salvation. Verse 17, he explains why it is the power of God into salvation. Verse 17, he says, For in it the righteousness of God is revealed. Now this word revealed is present tense. It is continuously being revealed in the gospel. Why is this righteousness of God being revealed in the gospel? Verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Why is the righteousness of God revealed in the, in the gospel? Because the wrath of God, same word, continuously being revealed. In other words, brothers and sisters, if we're simply just talking about not sinning anymore or getting a handle on our sin, that's not enough when we're talking about salvation. In other words, it would be enough then, if you want to turn back to Philippians, and I'll lay this out for you, but in Romans chapter 1, it's all about the, the issue of the fact that the wrath of God rests upon us as sinners. We stand condemned until we are in Christ. Romans chapter 8 verse 1, then there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. See, if it was just a matter of sinning less than in our life, then man could achieve this on his own. Paul could have achieved this on his own. But that's not what the righteousness is about. It's about the wrath of God upon us. In other words, it's deliverance from the wrath of God. And the only way that happens is through righteousness that comes in Christ and Christ alone. Otherwise, everyone who has ever gone to prison and said they found religion, they have found a righteousness. But it is not enough to enter into the presence of God. 
But those who have entered into a relationship with Jesus Christ, <laughs> that is enough. That is enough. See, that is the issue of this term here. It's about not facing the wrath of God. For the rest of the world, this is what awaits them if they don't repent and recognize the mercy and the grace of God as He offers this free gift of salvation. It isn't just merely about sinning less in your life. It is about getting out from under the wrath of God. Because God is holy. And he cannot let sin go. Book of Leviticus. It's clear. He cannot tolerate sin. And he cannot leave it undone. So this righteousness then from Dikaios means being proper or right in the sense of being fully justified and in accordance with what God requires. The biblical terms which talk about this deal with the acceptable, that which is acceptable to God in keeping with who God is in regards to his nature. He sets the standard. The standard doesn't lie outside of God. The standard lies within God. It is very nature. God determines what is right because God is holy. It isn't a standard that lies outside of Him that both God has to measure up to and we have to measure up to. He is the one who is the standard. And He is the one then determines how we approach God. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. The world wants to approach God on their own terms and in their own way. And God says, no, that's not how it works. Your wisdom isn't good enough compared to mine. It's foolishness. And compared to my weakness, <laughs> your power is nothing. It conveys the idea of being in a right relationship with God and of being rightly related to God. Thus the merit of Christ is His righteousness that God credits to the believer's account when we place our trust in Him. This righteousness comes to us through faith in Christ and it comes to us on the basis of faith. Twice Paul makes this clear for us. The Christian is given the gift of righteousness and has made the righteousness of God in Christ. See, this relationship to Him is everything. Everything. And the world must see this. They must see this in our life. Because without them, they have nothing. Without Him, we have nothing. Without Him, I am nothing. I don't know about you, but I, I could not hold back the tears singing this morning. I marvel at the grace and mercy of God in my life. I don't deserve to draw another breath of life in this life. I know who I am. And I know who I am without Him. But praise God, I know who I am in Him. And praise God, this is what he sees when he looks at me. As he sees me in Christ. So Paul understands that union with Christ is possible only because God imputed Christ's righteousness to us so that it is reckoned by God as our own. We will stand before him holy and blameless and above reproach. How is that possible? Right? This is the final analysis of God and His assessment of our life when He is done with us. Praise God. Because I'm sick and tired of sinning in my life. Soon as I think I have a handle on something, I don't. The fellowship of Christ then in verses 10 through 11. And these are the last thoughts. Knowing Christ as a source of resurrection power transforms us to live a life of fellowship with his sufferings and his glory. 
He returns to the thought of wanting to know him. Same word from verse 8. And he expresses this desire to grow in a deeper and more meaningful experience with Christ. It's interesting the theological truths that are here. And we, we can't miss this as we read through these letters. because, And this is the thing that I love about these letters. Is because everything is just jam-packed. right? Every word, every phrase, every verse. He moves from justification to sanctification to glorification. Bam, 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 bam. And I love this. It's a good reminder because during the Reformation, there was a focus on justification. And then the Wesleys came along. Praise the Lord for that. Because they had to bring us back to sanctification. We forgot all about that. But sometimes in our life, we so focus on the present struggles of life that we forget the glorification. There is hope. Man, there's hope. And it's not wishful thinking, amen? It's a sure promise. Knowing Him requires a genuine interest. Is this desire that we have in our heart, that we want to see and savor Christ. That means then we need to spend quality time with Him, right? When we cultivate relationships, right? We need to hear, we need to speak, we need to respond. It's how we interact with Christ. What kind of time do we spend with Him in every day? Maybe it's not the first thing you do in the day. I don't go to bed till 4 or 5 in the morning, so through the night, this is where I spend my quiet time because everyone's in bed. No one can disturb me. There's nothing on TV to distract me. <laughs> no games to watch. But how much time do you spend with Him? Do you really know Him? Do you know what He's done for you? Sanctification of the believer involves being conformed to the image of Christ, and this is the plan and desire of God the Father for us. Paul goes on to define this knowing of Him. He wants to know His power, the power of His resurrection. This is a dynamic power that operates in us, right? Tap into the source. Instead of picking up a Red Bull, lean into Christ. You hear what I'm saying? There's so many substitutes out there of things that we look for, right? to get us through the day, to get us through life, to help face this situation. He is the power. And he develops this for us in verse 10. And he adds this statement, and, which further explains the knowing of him. And it comes in two parts. And it's bound by this single article. And it's in the Greek, but in the English they insert this. But it's really just one article that governs the whole thing. So it makes it one single thought. It is the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. It's a unit. They each come with their own significance, but they're bound together. The first thing is this, the power of his resurrection. This is the strength and motivation for suffering. This is why he mentions it first. <laughs> Praise the Lord for that. He didn't start with suffering. He started with power. Power, right? God never calls us into something without giving us that which we can face it with. He never calls on us to serve without giving us the giftedness and the ability to do the serving. God always enables us when He calls us. Always. Even when we're tempted in life, He gives us an escape, does He not? So He wants to understand and experience to a greater level this power of resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings because it becomes possible and rich in meaning because of this resurrection. I gave you some thoughts last Sunday in regards to this. Christ's resurrection gives promise, it gives power, it gives perspective and purpose. And I leave this for you to ponder on, but the fact that he wants to know his suffering. Suffering. This isn't his expiatory sufferings, right? Talking about atonement. These are for Christ alone. Only he can do that. But yet there's still suffering to be had. And it's not merely just a necessity. Chapter 1, he says it's a grace gift from God that we suffer. <laughs> Why? Because it's in this suffering I'm being conformed to Him. It's in the midst of suffering that I lean into Him, that I cling hold of Him, that I grab on to Him, that I walk in dependence on Him. Paul understands this reality and he loves Christ so much that he wants to be conformed to him in every single way. Not only just in his sufferings, but also in his death. 
Now, I don't think that he's just merely reflecting on his death in the sense of a metaphorical way, in the sense that he wants to merely die to his self, die to his passions, die to his will. No doubt that's what he wants to do from Philippians chapter 3. But it's more than that, and he's willing to walk in this pathway of obedience as Christ did in chapter 2, verses 7 and 8, that he emptied himself, taking on the form of a bond slave, being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. He wanted to be so conformed to Christ that he was willing to follow him even to the point of physical death himself. Go back to chapter 1. That he might be exalted whether I live or whether I die. I want to know him so intimately, I want to know his sufferings. And not only that, but I'm willing to follow him into the valley of the shadow of death. See, the first law of nature, you know what that is? First law of human nature, self-preservation. You know what God calls us to do? To die to self. I end with this thought from Fee, and he says this, Christian life is cruciform in character. God's people, even as they live presently through the power made available through Christ's resurrection, are as their Lord forever marked by the cross. There is power, yes, but there is suffering. But praise God that the power is there. And all of this, verse 11, that we might arrive to the destination, that we might finish the race. And next week we'll come back and talk about how do we press on in this race. Let's pray. Our gracious Father, we're so thankful for your truth and the preservation of it. And Father, for the principles that are here and the realities of what you have done and accomplished in and through your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and in and through our lives. the fact that we can come before you this morning and that we can offer up songs of praise from hearts that have been set right in Christ is so astounding, so wonderful, so amazing. The privilege it is for us to be called your people and to be sons and daughters of you and fellow heirs together with your son who is son by nature as we are sons and daughters by adoption. We revel in these truths. We glory in these truths. We boast in Christ and in His work, even though we don't fully understand all of it, Father. But we pray that this day we might have a better understanding today than we did yesterday. That we would know Him better today than we did yesterday. And that when we go forth from here, we will live our life in a more radical way in regards to this relationship that we have with Christ because of what we know, because of who we are in Him, because of what you have done in and through Him and in us. We thank you for the presence of your Spirit. May we yield to Him, Father, moment by moment in our life. May we seek understanding from your Word And we see clarity every day in our understanding of who Christ is and what he demands of us, Father. May we passionately strive to work at our salvation knowing that you are at work in us. May we arise every morning realizing our responsibilities and obligations as we walk in relationship with a God who is absolutely, perfectly holy. That we would draw before you with awe and reverence that is due you because you are the most high God. You are El Shaddai. And yet in Christ you are our Father.
Thank you, Father, for all that we have in Christ our Savior, the blessings that we share and this shared life we have together. May we go forth manifesting that. Pray for your blessing upon all your people this day. We pray these things in your name. Amen.